Welcome to Voices of Liberation. I'm so excited to have you both here today. So tell the audience a little bit about who you are. Introductions, we'll start with you, Anita. Of course, hi, it's good to see both of you. It's been too long. Um, so my name is Anita Tuttle. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, I'm currently in my master's program at UCSB studying education. And I'm in my first placement here on the west side, um, and it's been going great. I have no complaints. Hi, I'm also so glad to be here with both of you. I'm Wendy Sims Moten. I've just learned my pronouns, she, her, hers. So I appreciate that, always learning something. <laughs> I am also the executive director for First Five, which focuses on children birth to five and their families. How do we make sure they get, they're strong and healthy and ready to start school? And I'm also a proud member of the Santa Barbara Unified School District. So I get to go from zero to 18 in, you know, a couple months. <laughs> so I'm glad, so glad to be here. Thank you both for that lovely introduction. And clearly by your introductions, I'm sure you know why I brought you both here. Because <laughs> you are both within the education sector. Um, and my first question to you both is, and either one of you can start, I think I'll start with you, Miss Wendy, is, what brought you into education? Like, when did you first have a passion for education? Um, and what, because you're not from Santa Barbara, right? Not originally, no. Yeah, so what, <laughs> what even brought you here? I'm interested Ooh, in that. Well, first of all, crazy boyfriend. And, and thank God for unanswered prayers. So I'm just saying, because I was praying for that first one, but that wasn't the prayer I really need to get answered. So that really is the truth. So I was there, I was 20 years old, and you know, needed, was free and thought, well, it's an opportunity to come back. My uncle was there for Christmas, and here I was, and here I have been. And it feels like this is where I always should have been, you know, growing up in Texas. You know, you see a lot of segregation. You see a lot of those things there, and you just think that's the way the world is. But, you know, it was different for me. I always wanted to do that. And so I think in terms of getting an education, I was in a family of teachers, you know, both Sunday school teachers, <laughs> you know, and actually teachers. My, uh, my aunt was a fourth grade teacher. And I had actually my first outdoor classroom with my brothers as my students. And so it's always wanted to teach and, you know, and just to be a part of learning and knowing how important education is to move us forward. And so that really has always been my passion. It has always been important to get that education so that you know who you are in any given situation. So that's my passion. It continues, continues to be that, you know, that that leads us forward. And that's how we move from one place um, to the other is we get informed the more we get informed, the more our hearts are inspired and our heads are informed. So yeah, yeah. so it's been great. I love the vulnerability. Yeah. <laughs> the crazy boy the honesty. Right. The honesty. Right. 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 What about you, Anita? I mean, me being a first generation college student and going straight from my undergrad to my master's program, I mean, education is all I know. I'm as comfortable at home as I am in a classroom. And I think that that's special and that's not something that a lot of people can say which is what I'm trying to change. You know, we should be comfortable in learning environments as they help us grow. Um, and so for me, being here in Santa Barbara, I mean, it's such a beautiful place, but there's change that needs to happen here too, you know? And so having that outlet in the classroom has been big for me, and I hope that I can like provide that to my students as well, mm -hmm. because it's important. Yeah, and you know, piggybacking off of what you said about how it's needed in Santa Barbara, what are some of the things that you both are noticing that's coming up, especially because, I mean, we're all clearly black here at the table. Mm -hmm. I know Anita, you're Afro-Latinx, mm -hmm. um, which is important. And I think that's very important to why I brought you to this conversation, mm -hmm. because we have a large Afro-Latinx community here mm -hmm. um, and just a mixed race community here with black and whether it's black white, black Afro Latinx. Mm -hmm. um, and what are some things you're seeing within the education sector as far as um, mixed race children go, um, as far as curriculum go within education? I mean, for me in my classroom and in my placement, I mean, I'm seeing a lack of it. So like for there to be this population in this community, but for there to be such a lack of representation in the classroom is daunting to me. Like, if they're here, then how come I'm not seeing them at school, you know? 
And so with that, how can we say that our curriculum is based on these students when they're not present in our classes? And so it's challenging because how do you change what's not present? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think about it um, that that is true, you know, in terms of how do we represent something that's not there that we know, we experience mm -hmm. it, but not necessarily in the whole. And so that impacts. And it also is, it, it even furthers the invisibility that's exactly. there, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we, how do we bring um, visibility to that? Mm -hmm. And I think we as representing those in the classroom, mm -hmm. me as a board member, mm -hmm. you know, as also a part of a First Five, we know it's there. So how do we do that in the things that we do, mm -hmm. in the things that we say, and, and bring that to the forefront uh, for that matter? And, and so I just want to also go back in terms of it, I think some of our kids, they're not sure which side to choose. I remember being in a talking in class and uh, this young man, he, he's Afro, Latino, and he's like, I don't know, I don't wanna make one side of my family mad, I don't want the other. So you might identify with just one side just so that you can just kind of get through and, mm -hmm. and not have to choose. But that, I think that's often the case too. And, and then the fact that we've just always been about one, we're saying America, but we don't really represent the diversity of America and be proud of that. And so as we start to see that change, the more that we talk about it, such as I know opportunities like that, you know, like the, what we're talking about to, today, curriculums that are going on, we have to speak up mm -hmm. and do that and, and be that voice and create environments where people feel comfortable enough to say it. And, and, and even to say, I'm not sure what, which side I want to be. I'm not sure what, you know, we want to be. So we really have to start looking at every entry uh, of let's make sure that we're providing the space. And you know, we use the word safe, but as I'm learning more and more, that's relative mm -hmm. to your experience, right? So why not creating a space where people feel free to share their vulnerabilities, right? And that they feel more comfortable in uncomfortable spaces, but the freedom to, to express that and be okay that someone's gonna hear that and that's gonna be valued because the more that we able to have freedom in our conversations, the more we're gonna be informed, the more our kids of, you know, biracialness or triracial, whatever, you know, cause we don't really, really know, yeah. right? But to, to just celebrate who you are, what, whatever you bring to where you're, we're gonna celebrate who you are and we're gonna help you in it. And if, and, and if how do we create a, a place where our students can speak up because if we're gonna change anything, it is gonna be with our student voice. 100% agree. And when I'm thinking in terms of creating liberated spaces, as I heard you, free spaces and um, inclusive spaces for all students, what are some ways that people can push for that, right, in their communities? So thinking of, you know, GUSD, Goleta Union School District, thinking of Santa Barbara Union School District, what are ways that people can push these initiatives and, and resolutions in the schools to make sure that it is really inclusive environments for all students? I think certainly for sure it starts with parent engagement and not only parent engagement, parent education. Mm -hmm. So I think early back in zero to five and we talk about birth to five, how are we then empowering our parents? Because we push for parents being their uh, child's first teacher. So how do we start to inform them, empower them, and how to be able to advocate once they get into school? And you know, now that we're going to TK and Universal, it's even earlier that we need to really start to inform our parents. And again, and create those, create those spaces wherever we can, and therefore parents know what to ask for, what they need to demand from time to time. And you know, um, so having that, having that comfortability to, to be able to say, you know, I learned this and this, or I had this and this, and I'm not seeing that, you know, here. And, and the schools must also come to the middle, too, mm -hmm. of being open space, that we don't just say it, you know, there's difference between intent and action that actually happens. So the spaces have to be created by which every student is coming, parents are coming. We have an environment that is welcoming and is inclusive. So when you come here, when you first seek your school, I want to go there because they are accepting, they are inviting who I am. Mm -hmm. And whatever is not there, I have the freedom to say, I'm not getting all that I need. So how can I do that? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think in line with that, it's just, it's a conversation and it has to be one that's organic and natural. And it has to be between home and school. There has to be a bridge for those 
relationships between guardian and teacher because they're, they're one and the same. It just depends on what time of day we're talking about. And so I think that if the conversation starts at home and comes to school and starts at school and goes to home, I think that that would be a step in the right direction. I hear that, I hear that. And I know as my kids are in the GUSD, so Goleta Union School District, and um, they have started things like the Social Justice and Equity Task Force. Um, I'm not sure what SBUSD has started, but one thing that I've been really trying to, you know, reiterate to school administration is like, parents need to be involved. We mm -hmm. need to be included, mm -hmm. um, but you also need to create spaces where we feel safe to be included. Mm -hmm. And that's really where I've seen the mishap as mm -hmm. far as me. I used to be that parent that just dropped my kids off and disassociated myself mm -hmm. from that whole environment, right? Because they didn't make me feel welcomed as a parent there. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm learning just as I'm growing and developing as a mother, like I need to be involved in my children's education. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering what are ways that schools can really include parents um, in ways that are safe for parents, especially our Latinx parents, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of our schools, the majority of the population is Latinx community, but I see a lack of outreach to them, a lack of involvement on the PTA, um, and just inclusiveness when it comes to like translation. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are ways that schools can make sure to involve parents in, in, in ways that are inclusive and liberated? I think we just have to look around. Sometimes you just acknowledge who's at the table and who's not. Why? Ask those questions. Why? Do an evaluation of your process. Do an evaluation of how we are engaging parents. You know, they are in, in, in educate parents, inform parents. You know, you have an orientation. You go to school and get the orientation. Parent orientation is just as critical uh, to the success, uh, you know, of their students and the, and, the, and the understanding of that. Oftentimes, it's like look around who's missing at this table, and you know, looking at your mission. Is it inclusive in your mission? And so that you have, that's your baseline. When everything else goes a little haywire, what is your mission? And are you on task with your mission? Are you in alignment, you know, with your mission? And be open to when parents are saying, I'm not getting this, and create that space where you're doing that. But oftentimes, we're not even looking around to see who's missing. We see who's there. And who's missing may be access because ours. Do we want to change PT hours? Do we want to change all of those things? We can do it. We absolutely, just in the last two years through pandemic, we were made to change some things, you know, and so, and, and we were pushed in a direction perhaps we should have already started to do and be creative and be innovative and really get into what, what is today's education about? You know, education has not changed in the way that it's kept up with the times. And so as we start to, to look at that and have those honest conversations and, and, and keep, keep on track with regards to that, so there's a lot of LCAP, which is, you know, that is the local uh, control accountability of funds of what's coming in from the state. How, what are you doing with that type of conversation and making sure that everyone has a voice in that? And the, when the voices are not there, you often hear me saying that I'm like, so just because we are small, uh, you know, groups that we have in here, they're the main ones we need to have at the table. If for some reason they're not there, the question is why and what do we need to do to ensure that they're there? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you brought up a good point with access. I know now being in kind of like post-pandemic school, it's even harder to see parents and like have that interaction. Like they talk about, oh, like, well, before the pandemic, you know, parents could come volunteer in the classroom. We would have in-person parent-teacher conferences. You'd see them picking up and dropping off, but now it's, everything is so brief and they're not allowed on campus because of the pandemic and just trying to mitigate COVID at the school. And so I think that that has definitely enhanced the difficulty of making a relationship, meaningful relationship with students' parents because we just don't see them. And it, so it, it's just really difficult and not to say that it's not important or necessary, but from the teacher side of things, that has been an enhanced difficulty um, of getting that connection to the student's home life from school when there's so much distance in between right now. Yeah, I hear that. 
I hear that. I'm also wondering what school life is going to be like once we're, I hate to say past the pandemic. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it. It, it doesn't, it doesn't no. feel like it'll ever get to a point where we're completely past it. Yeah. Um, but I do wonder what it'll be like, especially with some schools sort of transitioning now um, with maybe having parents on campus mm -hmm. and like reading in the classrooms mm -hmm. and engagement. I do think we've been challenged more with um, thinking outside the box, mm -hmm. right? With the pandemic happening. Mm -hmm. But I do hope that once it kind of comes to the point where we can be communal again and gather, uh, that we remember, right, all the sort of like disparities and inequities mm -hmm. that we were faced with mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And so I guess that leads me into another question of how did this pandemic change the way that you are um, engaging with your occupation? It completely changed it. <laughs> I mean, it completely changed it. And I mean, right now, going into the colder months, there's a lot more sniffling and sneezing and you just look at it different, you do. When somebody's coming up to you with a boogery nose, you're like, oh, turn back around, go back to the sink, you know, it's different. Um, but, and, it, and it's even just like in lessons and engagement, like you have to think about, you know, sharing of crayons, just little, little minute things that you wouldn't have thought of before. And so things like that, I mean, the kids wash their hands now more than ever, I think. Um, and they have hand washing socks, so they get it. But besides all of that, besides the things that are COVID related, it's changed it in a sense of, I, again, just the relationship with the parents or the field trips. I feel like more of the real life school things that I mean, I remember as an elementary school student, it's different for them. It is, and so I think more than it's changed my occupation, it's changed the students' day-to-day -day life in school, out of school too. Yeah, it, exactly, you know, and just to, to add on really the impact of the social and emotional health mm -hmm. um, that we don't mm -hmm. know for years to come. Right. And we definitely have to keep that on the forefront. I think we often think kids are so resilient that they don't, they'll, they'll get over it. Mm -hmm. But that's what, what's happening is that, that we're losing what we're seeing in front of us and kind of dismissing it because we think it's kids, but it, it later on manifests itself later on, mm -hmm. you know, in classrooms when you're 14 or 15 and, and, and different things. Um, and I, you know, I see the toll that is taking on our, on our teachers, see that every day, the mental health to be able to do that and how do we keep that motivated uh, and, and, and how do we look at it. And, but I do think that, because the kids, they're much better at it than us. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's just let's just be honest about yeah, that. They, they, <laughs> you know, you know, we talk about we get a lot of pushback on masks, and we understand that, you know, and we we get it too. But kids are like, okay, if you give me a Cinderella one or whatever character I like, I'm just gonna wear this and make it right. And so, so you just you all, it's almost like we could learn from them oh, in terms 100%. of how they are adjusting. But you know, we have adult issues in view that they don't have. But that has definitely take um, taken a toll. But I also think that that was probably their pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and we didn't maybe, you know, how do we address it then or either we did or we didn't, right? And so through the pandemic, those things got exacerbated yeah. because they weren't really taken care of. So hopefully through this, um, even there's some little bright spots, what can we do different, what we must do different, right? And how do we make sure that we're taking that, that time, the pause in between to where are we, right? Are we engaging our parents? Are we keeping an eye on our teachers and not, you know, keeping an eye on our, on, on our kids and what does that look like? And how do we then, you know, look at that in terms of the community? The community health also, mm -hmm. also determines your school health. Yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of like that, you know, the inequities, as you mentioned, that were pre-pandemic, well, they're probably even more so, but do we now, because we have the ability to think outside the box, can we look at them in a different way and, and acknowledge that they're there and not just part of this is what we do we're just going to continue to do the same thing. We have to think differently. How do we do it differently? And how do we work and, and talk together? It's almost like we have to have these conversations. Do we create space mm -hmm. in our days, in our lives to, to have the conversations to, to look different? And the more that we're able to do that, I think we'll begin to start that. And I'd heard uh, something about a, there was, this lady was winning something and and they thought she was going to win and win and win and win. And they're like, I think it was a horse and it was a triple crown, you know, whatever. You have to win three races. But um, she was saying that 
that they said, you should be winning the, the Triple Crown. And she says, well, we got a lot of work to do, but we've given ourselves a chance. And I think we know that we've got a lot of work to do, but if we start to have those conversations, think outside the box, we've given our chance, given ourselves a chance to make a better way for everyone and everyone concerned. So yeah. And we got a lot of work to mm -hmm. do. Yeah. I yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, I think that is relevant. Yeah. So across the board, <laughs> yes. we yeah. got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm especially in education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just me as a mom trying to be involved more, right? Mm -hmm. More than so my mom was even when I was, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm from Santa Barbara, I grew up in this community um, and starting to learn how things work, how committees work, learning from you, Miss Wendy, with how the board works. There's so many, like, I wouldn't say like, connect the dots, right? right. <laughs> There's so many avenues and yeah. how you have to connect right. A lot of moving parts yeah. that we just don't understand yeah. as parents when you're kids and you're in it that you don't understand. Yeah. Um, but like you said, kids are so resilient. You know, they just go with the flow, like you said, with the mask. Yeah. It, it's yeah. hilarious because <laughs> you have all these parents like, yeah. you're going to make my kids wear a mask. And the kids are like, uh, yeah. where's my mask? <laughs> they tell each other, like, yeah. is your mask over your nose? Like, they're good about checking each other about it. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they have it all. My son, like, comes home and he's just, walking in the house and he's got it on and I have to tell him, hey, you can take your mask off now. He's like, oh, great, I can take yeah. it off. Um, but just seeing the resilience of these, I like to call them babies, yes, right? Babies. babies. Um, and seeing um, one, how activated the youth are. And yeah. I think, Miss Wendy, you can speak to this uh, from this past year, seeing the youth involved. Um, and so I wanted to talk about what does it look like to involve youth in some of these power sectors, right? Um, because what does it look like to involve them on the board? What does it look like to involve? I was trying to um, be in the social justice and equity committee um, at my children's school and I was like, hey, we need children on the board. Like we need to hear from the youth. Um, and I guess I'll direct this to you first, Miss Wendy, is, is that something that's being talked about? Um, because I really think hearing from the youth will, is powerful. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You know, as I said, that's going to be the change because we're going to hear them and, and their world is different. It's going to pull us out of the world we used to be in and make us relative to where we are now. And so at SB Unified, we do have for the first time a student board member uh, on the board. Uh, you know, a former board member, uh, Dr. Uh, Jackie, she was like really pushing. We were pushing for that. And so they actually come to fruition. So we have a board member on there and really get to hear from his perspective. And it's really given us what what it looks like. This is the first time, it's almost like a pilot program, but it's actually be a, one that's rotating every year. I want everybody to see that they can be in that, in that seat and know that that's a seat of where your voice is really valued. I mean, we really can look to say, well, and it's, it's Dawson who's on our thing. He's like, so Dawson, what you think, you know? And as opposed to, we want you to come and report. He's actually reporting to us on the board. He's like in the street, in, you know, on the, on the street scene, so to speak, to, to tell us, you know, from that point of view, uh, what's going on because I know you know recently we we're looking at you know school resource officers we really were hearing from the student voice you know from even from the black student demands uh, how do we how do we do that that is so critical and I'm glad that they feel you know um, that their their voices are going to be heard that their voices are valued and you can you can tell that because they are active they are speaking up they, and these are some they can have some conversations so I said well in what grade are you in? You know, and so we're, you know, how do we continue to support them and, 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 and create a space where their voice, because it is about them. Mm -hmm. It is about teaching and learning and, and being student centered. That means we're going to hear your voice. We need to hear your voice. I also think in terms of students learning accountability for each other, you know, as we talk about campus safety, is how critical they are to the campus safety they would like to see. And so the world they would like to see, the school environment they would like to see, they've got to be able to articulate that in a way and also be accountable to making sure that it happens. And we, as the adults in that, have to create that space and ongoing and engaging in a way that is not just pacifying, but really relying upon their points of view and all points of view. And how do we then, um, in that space, create a diverse and inclusive point of view from all youth 
from their experiences because we all expect we are shaped by our experiences and those need to come to a common ground where we can begin to see each other hear each other uh, I heard something I don't want to be long-winded but I, when you when you say about you know when we did segregation and we were segregated all our teachers were black and we saw what was going on and everybody had a goal of where we were supposed to be and we knew that, but when we integrated, that was supposed to be for better. But what didn't come along was the black teachers. We kind of came on to another whole uh, where you're gonna be teaching and learning. And so we lost that whole side of teaching from a perspective of inclusiveness and seeing myself in my leaders, in my teachers. And that is something that's coming forth too. And our youth are bringing that because not all of them experience that segregation. They're like, well, we all together, why not? But but if you think about it, we've taken almost a step or two back with being so divisive. It's going back to we and they. But the more that we um, involve our students, like, well, everybody's coming along, then I think the better we're going to be. Amen. Yeah. You are right. Amen. It was such a pleasure having you both at the table and a part of Voice of Liberations. I like to gather hands. Yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. This yes. is Good this. Thank you. No, seriously, thank you both. This is communal. This is near and dear to my heart. Yes. And I'm so appreciative of you both being in the sector you're in and continuing to, I'm going to just say it, put on for black people. Because that's what y'all do it. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was thank a pleasure. You. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning in to Voices of Liberation.